Oh, hey. Welcome back, everybody. What's up, Meg? Hey. What's up? We're trying up? We're trying a new platform, so hopefully this sounds pretty good. Okay. Again, uh, we're trying Riverside. I've been very impressed with Riverside. You know what else I'm impressed with? The Deluxe Edition Network. Uh, go check them out. DeluxeEditionNetwork.com. We got two new podcasts of the month. Do you know what they are, Meg? No. It's Take on the World podcast, and this podcast called the Beard Laws Podcast. are the podcast of the month for the lovely month of November. So if you guys Yay. haven't checked them out, check out the Beard Laws Podcast. Check out Take on the World. Two amazing podcasts. The guy from the Beard Laws Podcast, he's all right. I don't know, but Take on the World, they're absolutely amazing. Check it out, DeluxeEditionNetwork.com. This story, thankfully, uh, Meg was able to kind of... Actually, it's kind of weird how it worked out. Cause we were both looking at stories to throw in here. Zach hasn't got back into the swing of things yet. He says, I talked to him the other day, he's going to get back into it. So, Zach, if you're listening, and I know you are, looking forward to having you do this next episode 32. But we were just looking for some information. We both came across this story, didn't we? It was kind of weird. Mm-hmm. I was like, ah, I was looking at this one, and you're like, what? I was looking at this one, and you're probably thinking, what is it? Well, it was a pretty shocking and mysterious murder that happened in upstate New York in the early 1900s. A murder that is so scandalous that there's actually conflicting versions of what really happened in this. And uh, the, like I said, there's a couple of different sources that we did use to do this. And each source has a little bit of a different version. But at the end of the day, it all ended up kind of being going to court, trial, jury, in trouble. So mm. we'll get to that. But again, it's uh, and this could honestly be one of, if not the greatest you know, murder mystery in all of upstate New York. I mean, thankfully, there hasn't been a ton, mm-hmm. but this one's a little bit uh, unique, and you haven't really read through the notes, right? No. So I'm interested to see. I skimmed the story. Yeah, I'm interested. I found it interesting, but uh, I don't know too much. Yeah, I'm interested to see kind of your take on this uh, as it unfolds. So mm-hmm. uh, if you guys are wondering what we're talking about and you didn't read the intro, we're talking about the murder at Big Moose Lake. Dun, dun, dun. There it is. Have you ever been to Big Moose Lake? I have not. You've heard of it, though? I have. Yeah, same with me. So, uh, interesting. All right, I'm super excited for this. Do you think we should do the intro? Mm Mm-hmm. Hopefully the intro plays as as good as we think. So, uh, I don't know. Let's try it. work very well so we're gonna probably have to edit the intro (laughs) in so anyways you're not here for the intro nor do you care you're here for this story here and then again (laughs) the big moose lake which is for anybody that doesn't know it's at the head of the moose river which i mean you probably could have guessed that and uh it's a large lake that's about five miles north of fourth lake in the adirondacks in upstate new york the lake is within both herkimer and hamilton counties and covers portions of the towns of webb and long lake You've heard of Webb and Long Lake, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. All right. So just like, you know, most movies that uh, that have a murder in it or murders that make a movie, it begins with a love story. Grace May Brown grew up in the village of South Otes- Otsalik. I don't know how to say that. I should have practiced it. <laughs> South, this place in, in Chenango County, New York. Either way, Grace was the middle child and daughter of a successful county dairy uh wherever they came from can't say it the, the the name of it dairy farmer she was reportedly given the nickname billy because of her love of the contemporary hit song won't you come home bill bailey hmm. you know the song i don't think hmm. i know that one hmm. maybe maybe we'll do like a royalty free karaoke version of that song in the background if, <laughs> if i end up editing it in so uh brown attended grammar school in the village and became close friends with a teacher Miss or Mrs. or Mr. Crumb and Crumb's husband. Oh, okay, Mrs. Crumb's and Crumb's husband. <laughs> I, did, I, I didn't want to say the first name. It's Maud. Oh, Maud Kenyon Crumb. <laughs> I don't know. I was just going to mess it up. And everybody listens to this and they're like, oh, here goes here goes Matt. Can't say another name. Doesn't <laughs> pre-read his notes and try to pronounce them. I do sometimes, just for the record, I just forget. I don't have much of a memory. Maud was a pretty common name back then. Yeah, it's pretty. I like it. All right, so later, Brown often signed her love letters, The Kid, after the Western outlaw, Billy the Kid. In 1904, at the age of 18, Brown moved to nearby Cortland to live with her married sister, Ada. 
right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, nailed it. And to work at the new Gillette Skirt Factory. Mm. While working at the factory, she meets someone. Who Do you know who that someone is, Meg? It wasn't you. So obviously, you think I was around <laughs> in 1900? And let's be honest, for anybody that's just listening can't really see me, I have a beard. When I think Gillette, I think Gillette razors, and I'm probably not doing too much work with the Gillette family. Unless they want to spend a lot of money and use my beard shaving, uh, Gillette hit me up. But either way, that someone was who, Meg? Chester. Chester Gillette. And you're going, okay, who is this Chester? Well, he was the nephew of the owner of the Gillette Skirt Factory. Actually grew up in Montana, kind of bounced around from place to place, didn't really have a great childhood. Uh, moved to Cortland, New York in 1905 to obviously work at the factory. Since he was the nephew of the owner, he met people, mostly people in the upper class society in Cortland. He then meets Grace. They begin a relationship. But this relationship had to be a very secret relationship because she's just a factory worker. And I said it like that, so hopefully you can you know, see the quotes because, you know, she's since she's the factory worker and definitely was not up to the family standards. But then it comes out, Grace Brown is pregnant. Oof. Yeah, she's 20. He's 23 at the time. And obviously we're in the early 1900s and Udwed mothers were outcasted from society back then. So then she decides, you know, let's let's go back to my parents' house uh, in the place that I had a really hard time saying, uh, just to kind of, you know, get away from the situation and everything. The two keep in touch, uh, Chester and Grace, by writing love letters back and forth. Hmm. Uh, in a lot of these letters, it was said that she was pretty much begging and doing everything she could for to try to get him to marry her. Then Gillette, he says, you know what? Let's go on a little vacation. Let's go to the Adirondacks, have ourselves like a romantic weekend. Many believe, including Grace, that it was going to kind of be, hey, he's going to propose to me. Maybe we're going to get married. Although other people kind of thought or even suggested in some of the letters, potentially, you know, he comes from money in this higher class society that he was going to kind of bring her, kind of hide her away in a maternity house where she could live until she ended up having the child just to kind of escape you know, the society and everything like that. And, you know, you, the, I mean, what, what's your initial thoughts? They, they're going to get proposed. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to be in this maternity house. You have any initial thoughts? Um, I'm going to go with not proposing. Okay. Okay. So the couple, they travel around the state a little bit. They spend the first night in Utica, New York, where they registered at a hotel under false names. They even left the hotel without paying little Bonnie Clyde action, right? Mm-hmm. Then they jump on a train to Tupper Lake to spend their second night. They planned an outing by a nearby lake, but once they, tried by, uh, once they arrived by train, it rained, it poured, and it just ruined the day. So they jump back on the train, and they end up going to Big Moose Lake on July 11th. Then they're like, hey, let's rent a canoe. Let's, have, let's spend the afternoon on the water on the lake. You know, it's beautiful. It's, um, you know, just going to be a beautiful day down here. And many people, they reported seeing the hotel guest who was going by the name of Carl Graham, which is Chester Gillette. They checked in. He had his bags. And even the bags had the initials C-E-G. But there was a tennis racket that was attached to this bag. And again, many people see the bag. They see him with the bag. Her luggage, though? apparently was reportedly uh, reportedly left at the train station for whatever reason. It's a little odd, right? Very odd. But even more odd, he brings the suitcase on the canoe trip with them, mm. with a tennis racket. Suspicious. Yeah, what are you thinking now? I think you're thinking what everybody else is thinking. Yeah. Things are about to go down, right? Maternity trip in air quotes. Yeah. It's then alleged that he used the tennis racket to smash Brown in the head. She falls into the water. Previously, apparently, Brown had told Gillette in one of the letters that she cannot swim. Gillette then flees the scene, spends the night at a hotel, giving multiple stories to different people of why he returned on that canoe trip alone. Brown's body surfaces not long afterwards. They do the autopsy and everything, and it reveals there's severe bruising on her head and a four-month-old fetus inside of her. After Brown's body was found the next day, Gillette is arrested in a nearby town. So let's skip ahead a little bit 
to the trial, which actually occurs in Herkimer, and it was the biggest trial to ever happen in that area. Newspapers all over the state are covering the story. It is everywhere. Hundreds and hundreds of people would actually come to the courthouse just so they can witness this event. The defense trial claims that Grace had been confused, suddenly jumps out of the boat and into the water despite being fully clothed. Gillette actually testifies and says, and, uh, and we quote from some stuff that we pulled up, we talked a little more. Then she got up, jumped in the water, just jumped in. But the DA insisted Gillette hit her over the head and did nothing to save her. Uh, it kind of goes back and forth that he hit her in the head with that tennis racket, an oar, something of that nature, and uh, just didn't go in to, to save her. The love letters are then confiscated from Brown's possessions and definitely told another tale. So the letters actually help this trial gain national attention. In her letters, Brown pleaded with Gillette to accept responsibility for her pregnancy. And in her final letter written July 5th, Brown looked forward to her impending Adirondack trip with Gillette. She said farewell to her childhood home in that place that I can't say, wishing she could confess her pregnancy to her mother. And this was in the letter quoted uh, being written by her, I know I shall never see any of them again. And Mama, great heavens, how do I love Mama. I don't know what I shall do without her. Sometimes I think I could tell Mama, but I can't. She has trouble enough as it is, and I couldn't break her heart like that. If I come back dead, perhaps if she does not know, she won't be angry with me. So she, apparently, don't you think in the back of her mind, thinks that something's going to go down and she could mm. actually end up dead and never see her mom again. Isn't that heart, like, that just yeah. pulls on your heartstrings? I was going to have you read it, but I, I, I didn't want, in case it upset you, I didn't want it to upset you in there. So, but What's even more crazy is actually copies of Brown's love letters were published in a booklet form and were actually sold outside the courtroom during the trial. I have a feeling that can't go down these days, especially because it's probably going to be part of evidence. Mm -hmm. Theodore Dreiser, is that how you'd say that? Yeah. Yeah, let's go with that. Paraphrase many of these letters <laughs> in his novel, An American Tragedy, quoting the final letter almost verbatim. Jennifer Donnelly used many of these letters in her novel, A Northern Light. Letters written between the two, as well as Gillette's diary, have been donated to Hamilton College. Hmm. Interesting. So on December 5th, 1906, three weeks after the trial started, nearly five hours of deliberation, the jury finds Gillette guilty of murder in the first degree, and he was sentenced to death by electric chair. He was reportedly calm and even smiling when his sentence was handed down. That's sick, right? Mm -hmm. He was then transferred from the Herkimer County Jail to the Auburn Prison, which is now obviously the Auburn Correctional Facility, where he was executed on March 30th, 1908. As his last days on earth were nearing closer, Gillette reportedly confessed to the murder to his spiritual advisors at the prison who never revealed the exact details. Hmm. That's wild, right? He didn't reveal them or his advisors? The, the spiritual advisors at the prison never revealed the exact details. Nobody did. Huh. So nobody exactly knows what goes down. I mean, at the end of the day, he murdered her. I mean, he confessed to that, and there's not much he could... Do I don't think I mean it's not going to change the outcome. She's not coming back. Their baby's not coming back, and he's not coming back. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's wild to me too. I mean, obviously 1900s different time, but they were just like going in the chair. You're done. First degree murder. See ya. Mm -hmm. This goes down today. Doesn't go down like that. So um, this is a this is a little bit crazy as well. Kind of after that, he he passes away. They put him down or whatever you might say. His body was moved to nearby Seoul Cemetery where it was buried in an unmarked grave. According to the celebrity grave enthusiast, the plot had a road paved over it. In the exact location of the grave, nobody knows. It's kind of crazy they can do that. Right. I mean, <laughs> 1900 was a little bit different, but, I mean, they just said, hey. I mean, assuming that it was in the 1900s when they just decided to pave over a cemetery. Yeah, but uh, and, and to this day, there's still many people that are fascinated by this story and, you know, something in, is small of an area and, and definitely Adirondack Mountains where we have some ties to and stuff. It's just, uh, it's pretty crazy. I, I honestly, until we started looking at the details, I've never heard of this uh, this crazy murder. Did you? Mm -mm. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. But what else is interesting from this, the murder of Grace Brown actually influenced the 1925 Adirondack folk song, The Ballad of Big Moose Lake. It also inspired the 1951 movie, A Place in the Sun, 
and was also the premise for many other works, a 1925 uh, novel, an American tragedy, a 1926 play, and a 2005 opera of the same name, American uh, Tragedy. And this just to name a few. There's a lot of stuff that have came from there. And once... Uh, what was once the Herkimer County Jail still stands today, as well as the courthouse, which is property of the Herkimer County government and is currently headquarters for the sheriff's department. Tours of the area are given by Herkimer County Historical Society very often. So if you're in the area, or maybe if we're in the area, we'll do a little tour ski, take some pictures. But what else is a uh, kind of whether you believe in it or not and... Uh, you know, it's something that uh, that a lot of people into, like, the ghost hunting and, and, and ghost shows like that. Apparently, several sightings have been reported. Um, people are hearing things. People are seeing things. And it's uh, apparently the ghost of Grace Brown right around Big Moose Lake. So kind of an interesting thing. Uh, I, I would have to imagine with the tragedy, the trauma and stuff like that, there's some stuff that went down there. So if you're looking to hike, camp, boat, go check it out for yourself. And we talk about a lot of those kind of historical blue signs. There's uh, one in Grace Brown's hometown that kind of marks the event. And there's also one uh, at the Glenmore Hotel where the murder scene went down. So if anybody happens to be there, send us a picture. And we do have some pictures lined up on the socials. But that's a, that's a pretty wild story, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So again, uh, thanks for having the same idea and being on the same page as me for this one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, shout out to our sources, Adirondack.net, Wikipedia as always, and New, uh, NewYorkUpstate.com. Had a cool couple of articles in there. The New York Up- Upstate one was from like 2016. And the Adirondack.net slash history slash Grace dash Brown. And uh, we'll end it with a quote, and I thought it would be kind of fitting to end it with a quote from the book, An American Tragedy by Theodore Treiser. What matter it if a man gaineth the whole world and loseth his own soul? Because essentially, I mean, the, the nephew had, had anything that he wanted in life and lost his life for what he did. So, I don't know. That was a pretty interesting one. And as always, if you guys have anything you want us to cover, you know, a story that is from your town, a town near you, just some crazy stuff of some small towns before they were big cities, we'd love to hear it. So shoot us an email. Feel free to, you know, message us on Instagram, whatever it is, and and we'd love to put our take on your story. So uh, that's all I got. Anything else, Meg? I don't think so. I don't think so? All right. Well, appreciate you. Thanks. Appreciate everybody taking some time to listen, (laughs) watch, look. Check out the clips, all that stuff. Make sure you check us out on all the social medias. Check out the Lux Edition Network, and can't thank you enough. And if you've ever been to yourtown.com, we have episodes there, and we actually have a map. I don't even know if you've seen this, Meg. We have a map, and we put a little pin, like a little tech, red little push pin or whatever you might call it, Mm -hmm. on or around every single location that we do a story. So obviously a lot of them in New York, but with the mole people, the you know the the Halloween murder that we did in California. Since we're an international podcast, we did one in Texas. Canada, Texas. We have uh, we have those on yourtown.com, so feel free to uh, check that out. It's kind of a cool thing that I thought of in my little brain. So, all right, that's all we have. Hopefully, you guys have a fantastic week, and we'll be back next week. All right, take care, everybody. Bye.